مرحبا واهلا بكم في برنامج داخل واشنطن معكم مضيفكم روبرت ساتلوف تراكز واشنطن من جديد على محاكمه الرئيس وفي هذه الحاله رئيس سابق لاول مره في تاريخ امتنا يعزل مجلس النواب رئيسا للمره الثانيه ولاول مره تنأكد المحاكمه بعد نهايه مده ولايه الرئيس نفس البلد يعتقد أن هذا أمر حتمي وضروري وفي حين عن نفسه الآخر يعتقد أن هذه مجرد مسرحية سياسية ولكن حياة بلدنا لن تنتظر انتهاء مهاجم الأزل الجائحة تستئر برغم تلقي ملايين للقاحات قادتنا يتجادلون حول حجم الحزمة الاقتصادية لمساعدة الأمريكيين الذين يعنون من تبعات الحالة السخية التارئة والحزبان السياسيان كلاهما يواجهان سراءات داخلية عميقة لتحديد قواتهما وماذا يريدان وكيف يفوزان بالانتخابات القادمة بعد 21 شهرا من الان. لمناقشه السياسات الوطنيه والمحليه خارج اطار محاكمه ازل دونالد ترامب يسرني ان ارحب بالصحفيين المتميزين والخبيرين السياسيين جيسيكا تايلر وارني ساكس. Welcome back to Dakhil Washington. There is a lot going on in Washington at the moment from impeachment to stimulus. But I wanted to take this show to discuss what else is going on in American politics, because there's a lot going on there, too. Let's start with you, Ernie Suggs, in Atlanta, Georgia. That was the setting for a great January upheaval that sent two Democratic senators, one black, one Jewish, to Washington. And uh, it's also the home of uh, one of the most wacky Congress people in American history. Marjorie Taylor Greene. So let's first talk about the uh, the Senate change. What's the local reaction to having two Democratic senators replacing two Republican senators? Uh, well, we had a seismic shift here in Georgia. Uh, as you mentioned, a Jewish man and a black man were elected to the United States Senate from the, from the state of Georgia, which is a southern state, which is a, is a Confederate state. Um, and it's it's been groundbreaking. I mean, I think that uh, Raphael Warnock, who is a pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church, Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, home church, and John Ossoff, who was an intern or young, a 33-year-old Jewish former intern of John Lewis, were elected to the United States Senate, which nobody could have probably predicted 20 years ago, a black man and a Jewish man. So you have the Democratic Party, you have, you have Georgia, which when I moved here in 1997 was pretty much a solid Republican conservative state, which it is still very conservative, but we've had this political shift and we've had this shift that's been going on for several years now. And finally, you know, every year, every election season, the 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 the, the suburbs of Atlanta get bluer and bluer, got more democratic. And finally in 2020, it kind of went over that edge and it elected these two men who no one would have expected they would be elected. You know, they were running against an established um, Republican and, and, and David Perdue, who are running against a very well-funded uh, Republican woman, and Kelly Leffler. So no one predicted, no one could have possibly predicted this five years ago, but Georgia's excited, Georgia's turned blue. Not only did Ossoff and Warnock win their elections, but also Biden won the state, you know, so that's very monumental right here in Georgia. And uh, Jessica, how has this election, the uh, the coming to uh, to the Senate of these two Democratic senators from Georgia. How has this altered the Senate, both in terms of control and even more broadly in terms of the political environment, um, the, the aroma, the oxygen of uh, life in the Senate? Well, right now, the Senate is as divided as it comes. It is split 50-50, and Democrats have control because Vice President Kamala Harris is the tiebreaker. Uh, but there's a lot of division still going on that you need, you know, she's already broken some ties on some bills that they voted on last week. Right now with the stimulus negotiations, there's even, you know, some resistance to things among 
moderate Democrats such as Joe Manchin from West Virginia. So this does not give Senate Democrats, you know, a huge mandate. And they've got to work within their own party. They've got to sort of try to work across the aisle, even though it looks like right now with the current stimulus bill is that Democrats are just going to, you know, push forward. They seem to have made some, um, you know, some some compromises, likely the $15 minimum wage is not going to get in there. Um, you know, it's going to be $1,400 checks, it looks like, rather than the 2000 which is something that, you know, was was a big topic during those, during that, during those Georgia races, certainly. But, you know, they're pointing to, well, $600 checks already went out, $1,400, that makes 2000 But a lot of people were expecting $2,000 checks on top of it. And then we have impeachment, an impeachment trial going on too, this sort of distracting from the rest of the business of the Senate and really sort of threatens to inject even more partisanship into what is going on right now, even though we have some moderate Republicans and even some surprises that could cross the aisle. You know, certainly it's a it's a constitutional process that is going on. And when what happened after the events of January 6th, um, feel like they need to move forward on that. And certainly that is their constitutional right. But there is, you know, it's a push and pull sort of because you have a new Senate, you have, this is the first time Democrats have been back in unified control since 2010. And so they're eager to, I think, move forward on things. And you have a lot of things that are still sort of proving as distractions in a way. Uh, let me just ask you, Ernie, um, one of these two senators, uh, Raphael Warnock, uh, is up for re-election in just two years. It was a real oddity that we had two Senate elections in one state in the same year. Uh, are, the, are the forces um, um, of, uh, of opposition, uh, the, the, the Republican Party in Georgia, I would imagine they're going to be marshalling their forces to try to reverse this remarkable democratic sweep um uh this year yeah well let me let me just say this in 2020 we had a georgia had an amazing election season you know with the with the uh with the election of the two senators but we like to say that the race is not over because as you said warnock has to know has to run again in two years because he's filling an un, un um fulfilled spot so the republicans are already lining up to try to find a candidate to challenge um rafael warnock who that candidate is going to be, we don't know. But they're also lining up to find a candidate to uh, to perhaps primary the Republican governor, to primary the Republican secretary of state. So, you know, as, 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 as was mentioned, there's a lot of upheaval, a lot of turmoil that's going on right here in Georgia within the Republican Party because they're trying to figure out where they are. They're so stunned by what happened in, in January and November that they're trying to constantly try to figure out ways in which they can regroup. So yeah, Raphael Warnock will be challenged, obviously in two years, but also in two years, the Republican governor and the Republican secretary of state are also gonna be looking for challenges on the right of where they sit to challenge their offices, which is kind of pretty much unprecedented in Georgia as well. Because they're uh, uh, Jessica, from Georgia. their own party. So Jessica, Georgia is on our uh, focus today also because of uh, the story of Congresswoman Green, um, uh, without getting into her her eccentricities, what makes her situation so unique, especially in terms of how the House of Representatives has responded to her? Well, I think it's sort of emblematic of the pull within the larger Republican Party, even though they lost overall, they lost the presidency, they lost the Senate, they made gains in the House, but that what is the direction post-Trump? You have people like Green that are still the base of the party and that a lot of voters there in North Georgia that is very conservative um, like her and like what she's saying. And I think that, you know, they removed her, Democrats voted at, over overall to remove her from her committees after the House Republican Caucus um, did not act. But that's sort of given her more oxygen. She's able sort of to free up and she can go on right-wing television and sort of spew these conspiracy theories. And I think overall what it tells me, you know, as Ernie was talking about, is that 
Georgia, the Georgia Republican Party, I think, has a lot of soul searching to do because they lost major elections that they were not expected to lose. And I think the lessons that they should have learned is that Georgia is changing, that it is now, especially around the Atlanta suburbs, it is a highly educated, diverse area. And, you know, certainly the surge in black vote is what turned the election, but also you had white suburbanites that fled the Republican Party that were voting for Democrats. And you did not have rural Republicans, including in Marjorie Taylor Greene's district. There was a major drop off there, even though President Trump had held an election eve rally to try to get those voters out. So they seem to be leaning more toward that right wing of the party as as he mentioned, trying to primary Brian Kemp because he simply went by the letter of the law. The Republican Secretary of State went by the letter of the law instead of trying to overturn it, which would have been unconstitutional. Um, so the states that are changing, the Republican Party still sort of seem stuck in the past. Arizona is another place where that is happening, where they also lost a seat there, where Mark Kelly, similarly, because he was elected in a special election, will be up again. And the Arizona Republican Party just censured probably their best possible Senate candidate, Republican governor there, Doug Ducey. So they're moving more toward the right, while these states are moving more toward the you know, more toward the left, the center and the left. And, and Ernie, just specifically about uh, Congressman uh, back home, what's the local reaction uh, to uh, the censure of the, the House of Representatives? Does this help her or does this hurt her? As Jessica said, this is, it's kind of a two-way two -way street. It helps her in a sense that she is playing to her base. She has raised a lot of money, probably close to half a million dollars, since she's been, you know, in this spotlight, being taken off of her committee. So she's raised a lot of money. But, you know, the media here in Georgia, particularly, is trying to temper how we cover her. Do we cover every tweet that she says? Do we cover everything that she says, uh, everything that she does? So we got to draw a balance as to what is, we have, a, we have a story about her in the front of the paper today, as a matter of fact. But we have to draw a line as to what we do. Where does it, where does the line draw that this is a wacky politician up in, in North Georgia, you know, she has no power anymore in the, in the Congress because she has no committee. So what is she going to actually be doing for her constituents here in North Georgia? So we got to temper how we cover her. But, you know, this is only, like Jessica said, this has only made her stronger. And it's going to be very, very interesting to see where her political career goes. When you ask me about, you know, who's going to run against Warnock, you know, there's some people saying that she might be the person. She might be a person who may run for governor. She might run for Secretary of State. So we don't know what the future is with uh, with the Marjorie Taylor Greene, but it's going to be very interesting to see where it goes and how she progresses over the next uh, year or so. All right. Well, just to just to tell you, I, I did an editorial for this show, which focused not so much on Green, but on the three quarters of the voters in her district that voted for her. They're the ones that I am uh, really want to know more about. All right. Yeah. When we come back... Right. We're going to expand the aperture of our discussion and talk a bit about the uh, the challenges facing both the Democratic and the Republican parties in the weeks ahead. Our guests in just a moment. As we all know, January 6th was a dark day in America, the day a motley band of insurrectionists and rebels attacked the U.S. Capitol, assaulted law enforcement, destroyed federal property, threatened the lives of America's elected representatives and tried to prevent the constitutional process of the counting and certifying Joe Biden's victory in the Electoral College. But it was not the first time the Capitol came under attack. That first belongs to the British, who in 1814, yes, 1814, retaliated for an American attack on their colonial capital in York, Canada, near present-day Toronto, by attacking the U.S. Capitol and the White House. The fire didn't completely destroy the Capitol way back then, but it did damage it enough that some members of Congress suggested re relocating the federal government back to Philadelphia or to find another city to serve as capital. But in the end, they decided to stay. The Capitol was repaired, enlarged, and ready to face a challenge that no one ever thought would happen. Not an attack by enemies without, but an attack by enemies within. Something that didn't even occur 
during our civil war. How appropriate then that Joe Biden, in his inaugural address, would call for an end to what he termed our uncivil war. Again, my guests today include Ernie Suggs. Ernie has reported for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution for the past 24 years. A native of Brooklyn, New York, this award-winning journalist penned a 17-piece series titled Fighting to Survive, Historically Black Colleges and Universities Face the 21st Century. That has been called, quote, the most in-depth newspaper examination of the topic ever undertaken. An alumnus of the prestigious Neiman Fellowship at Harvard University, he now serves on the Neiman Foundation's board. Also joining us is Jessica Taylor. Jessica is an editor for the Cook Political Report, where she focuses on the senatorial and governor races around the country. And uh, from where you sit, Ernie, um, uh, which trend do you see as, uh, um, as having you know, more enthusiasm, the, the trend line of, of uh, uh, Liz Cheney, uh, the more establishment-oriented Republican, or still the Donald Trump, Marjorie Taylor Greene trend line? I still think it's the Donald Trump, Marjorie Taylor Greene line that's getting the more, most enthusiasm. But this is one of those situations where Kevin McCarthy shouldn't have had to, had to have any decision in either one of these women. You know, why are you defending Marjorie Taylor Greene, and why is the Republican Party, as I said, they're eating themselves in a, in a way. Why are you challenging Liz Cheney, who's the most senior most woman, who's the senior most female in the House, the third leading, uh, the third ranking, third ranking Republican in the House, who voted on her conscience to do the right thing? Why is there, why is there a debate about that? So this is, again, why there's so much turmoil in the Republican Party over things like choosing between Liz Cheney and Marjorie Taylor Greene. If you put these two in a vacuum, you have to ask, which one do you choose? The, the, the whack, quote unquote, wacky person who spouts conspiracy theories about lasers and Jewish people versus the daughter of a former vice president who made a, who made a vote based on facts, then who are you going to choose? And the Republican Party is having a difficult time choosing, and that's probably going to be part of their problem as it comes to these, this next election cycle. So let, let me ask you about on the other side of the aisle. We are now, oh, three months after the election, a month after inauguration. Um, uh, is there anything left from Joe Biden's call for national unity um, in his inaugural address? Uh, Jessica, as you walk uh, or as you talk to people on Capitol Hill, does anybody still even remember the call for national unity? I will say there there does seem to have been a change in, I think, because you have a White House that is acting different, that is acting as a normal White House, be it Republican or Democrat, that Trump was such a shock to the system and that he just eviscerated Democratic norms. You know, we are not, we are no longer, you know, I don't wake up and look at my Twitter account to see what the president has tweeted. I mean, it's just very different. It's only been you know, three weeks. Um, but I do think that just because it is so closely divided, um, you know, Biden has shown a willingness to listen to Republicans. He had Republicans in the Oval Office to discuss this COVID recovery package. But I think there is a pressure to just get something done. And that pressure seems to be looking like it will win out. Um, you know, they're pointing to that a majority of people in polling supports their, you know, supports doing a lot of these things. And and Ernie out there in the hustings out in, in a place like Georgia, does this profound shift from uh, from Donald Trump to Joe Biden, has it brought the blood pressure of uh, of politics down a bit? I think it has. As Jessica said, it's, it's, it's very refreshing not to wake up every morning at seven o'clock and look at Twitter the first thing in the morning. But I think that, you know, I think Biden and the Democrats have decided that, you know, we want unity or they want unity in the party. They want unity across the country. But like with the stimulus package, they, they have to move on. They have to do things that are that are not going to be very popular amongst the Republicans because they want to move on. And they see that there are some cases the Republicans are not willing to bend, just like the Republicans were not willing to bend when Trump was in office. They moved through. They passed things. 
that push through their agenda. And I think Biden is going to have to see that this is what he's going to have to do as well to get his agenda, because I don't think that a lot of Republicans, particularly in the Senate, are going to be um, as amenable for unity as he is. All right. Well, with that, we're going to bring this conversation to a close. Thank you both, Jessica and Ernie, for helping to explain these first few weeks of uh, the Biden administration. And I look forward to having you both back on Dackle Washington before long. Thank you very much. Here's a serious question for political scientists, philosophers, and theorists of democracy. Can the people, lots of people, thousands of them, ever be wrong? I don't mean wrong in the sense of weighing two reasonable options and choosing one that history eventually shows was a poor choice. I mean just wrong, clearly, obviously, blatantly wrong, such as voting by a large majority, no less, for a raving lunatic to serve in federal office as a duly elected member of the United States House of Representatives. That's the situation with the congressional representative from the 14th District of Georgia, a region in the northwest corner of that southern state. In November, the district voted by a margin of three to one to send Marjorie Taylor Greene to Congress. Of the 307,000 votes cast, 230,000 of them were for Green. And the fact is, she's a lunatic. It's not that she joined with more than 100 of her fellow Republican congresspeople in disputing the legitimacy of Joe Biden's election victory, even after the January 6th insurrection. That was a political decision I may decry and denounce, but it reflected some version of a cold political calculation. Rather, she publicly and proudly has endorsed crazy conspiracy theories, suggesting, for example, that the terrible school shootings that left dozens of kids dead in recent years were really events staged to support gun control, and that wealthy Jewish financiers triggered an interstellar radar system that beamed down from space and caused the California wildfires. Now, I dislike and oppose many fringe figures on the American political scene, on the far left and the far right. But she gives fringe totally new meaning. The purpose of this editorial is not to focus on Green, who is just too wacky to merit our prolonged attention. Rather, I want to focus on the 230,000 people who voted for her. And that came, I should point out, after she won a Republican primary and then a Republican runoff election to choose her as the party's candidate. So she was on the ballot three times in 2020, and she won all three times. That reality deserves our close attention. It says something important about our politics, about our national political literacy, about the seriousness with which key parts of our electorate take their responsibilities as citizens. Can the people ever be wrong? Well, sadly, the answer is yes. But if, as Ben Franklin warned, we want to keep the democracy we have, we should take a close look at what is really going on in places like the 14th District of Georgia to ensure that the Marjorie Taylor Greens of our politics are just rare circus oddities, never to become more common than that. Twitter, hashtag Inside Washington. Oh, on Teresa Luni Mubasharatan, Allah at Rob Satloff. Sarakumalos Boil Mukbil, Wa Illa on Al Kakum, Shukran Lakum, Wa Illa Lekah.